With me, I have Mr. Adnan Omron, a former Syrian ambassador to the United Kingdom and Sweden, and also a former Deputy Secretary General of the Arab League. He's a political analyst and Arab thinker. So thank you very much for joining us here on RT. I thank you. And greetings to your uh, TV station. Too much democracy too soon. Is that what we're witnessing in the Arab world? And does it mean chaos for countries like Egypt? It is too soon to say there is much democracy or there is democracy or not. Because uh, democratic uh, slogans put before elections do not mean that necessarily the winner is going to be to practice democracy. So I would say we have to wait and see. Are we using the right terminology when we talk about the Arab Spring? I, I wonder why I <coughs> use this word. <laughs> By the way, uh, this season, spring, is the season of uh, storms in the region. Normally they come with, the, with dust from South Sahara or whatever. Second, spring in our countries, they don't, we don't have any fruits, anything really produced. The real season, which is season of production, is summer. Winter gives the, 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 the rain, etc. Spring is the season where you have to wait and see whether there is going to be a positive outcome or not. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warns that the Arab Spring will turn into an anti-American, anti-Israeli, anti-democratic tsunami. Does the Arab Spring really challenge the American and Israeli standing in the region? Or on the contrary, does it actually promote their interests? First of all, Netanyahu's statement and the statements made by other Israeli leadership uh, they are very subjective. They originate from the very narrow interest of Israel. They are not uh, objectively talking about the subject. So he, <clears throat> they are concerned mainly of how much surrender or yielding or concessions can the new regimes give to Israel or not. On the light of this, they make their judgment. So if those new regimes going to oppose certain disadvantaged uh, agreements like Kim David or others. Of course, they wouldn't be happy about it because that agreement was 90% at least in favor of Israel. What is your sense of what is happening here in Egypt? How do you predict events will unfold? No, I think we have, you have to remember always that Egypt is a very important Arab country. It's a rich country with the, with the knowledge and culture and all these things. Economically speaking, of course, there are you know, areas of strength and areas of weakness. What is more important now is to build really democratic society, far from the influence of any element, whether this element is a military element or religious element or any element from outside. And I'm, f I'm afraid that all these elements are a threatening factor in the future politics in Egypt. Your president, Bashar Assad, is promising democratic elections next year. But do you think the West is putting pressure on him because they want to derail those elections? Absolutely. This is now an established fact. They have uh, started the process of democracy, uh, calling on all parties to join a dialogue in, uh, in finalizing the laws, the constitution, the decrees on election, on parties, etc. But it was strange for everybody in the region to hear Mrs. Clinton going on record and calling on certain opposition groups not to go for dialogue. And even more than that, justifying the flowing of arms to those groups. The question mark here, which is very big and very dangerous, what do Americans need in the region? Do they need democracy or do they need chaos? Are they, they really uh, committed or they have still something left of the principles set by Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and all the leaders in their own history? Or they are stick to what Kamdilista Rai said and Bush said, that we are going to restructure the Middle East partitioning the Middle East. What about Iran? Do you think NATO and Israel have the military and economic capabilities to strike Iran? 
I do think that they have the capability, but if the question is, do they have the capability of, of winning the war, I doubt it very much, because Israel will pay a very, very heavy price. The countries in the region, all together, will suffer because of such kind of stupid adventure. I hope that they will be uh, less mad and consider the lessons of the past. The recent lesson would be the invasion of Iraq. Imagining the United States of America, when they invaded Iraq, they thought they're going to a feast where they can have some, you know, uh, military operations, and then can they have the cake all together, the oil, the, the military bases, etc. And now we are seeing them fleeing, leaving Iraq after they paid hundreds of billions of dollars in a weak economy, and after they caused the suffering of more than almost, almost a million victims. And this is stupidity. I hope they will learn that the peoples of the area here, they can win a war, but the peoples will fight with everything they have in order to see the backs of those soldiers leaving the country. When one looks at the strong anti-Iranian statements that are being made by both the United States and Israel, are we seeing an Iraqi scenario in relation to Iran where there's almost a pre-war before the actual war? Uh, look, I, I agree with you that they are the same slogans. But Iraq, Iran is not Iraq. Iran is much, much stronger militarily. And uh, they have many, many cards to play. I, I think the Americans know that very well. They want to pressure these countries. The edge of the table, they are playing that kind of game, going as far as possible, threatening of invasion in order to yield to, to have more concessions paid by Iran. I doubt whether this policy will succeed because the Americans are very, very well known in the region. There is no credibility for the Americans. American interest now is very clear. They want Israel a dominating uh, a, a, a country in the region. They want Israel is the only uh, nuclear power in the region. Israel is a military American base. And they have, now the Americans are so fond of establishing bases in the region. Almost only few countries in the region don't have American military base, including Turkey, which is a very, very big country of 70 million. The biggest, one of the biggest uh, military bases are in Turkey. They were considered to be as a spearhead against the Soviet Union at that time. And I think the same duty is now, but the name is not Soviet Union now, the name is Russia. And I'm sure that Turkey, I remind only of the last uh, new bases established in East Turkey, what for? People talk about protecting Israel from Iran. Yes, this is not a wrong thing. I mean, it's, it's correct. But more important, it is part of the strategy of reviving Cold War and surrounding Russia with all destructive bases. Do you think the Turkish-American alliance will continue? Because if one looks at Turkish society, it is changing, and one does see more Islamists coming to the fore. No, I, I think for the time being, uh, the leadership in Turkey is quite uh, fulfilling their own obligations, as they call it, vis-a-vis -vis the NATO and vis-a-vis -vis the CENTO and vis-a-vis -vis also the, the bilateral agreements which exist between Turkey and America and Turkey and Israel. So, so far they are doing this. How long this will go, I believe that the people in Turkey, which is a very enlightened people and uh, enjoy great ability of thinking politically, will not probably accept that for long. And I remind you that uh, that was not easy when the ruling party now came to power in 2002. They could not, they didn't dare to challenge the public opinion. So they didn't involve Turkey in the, in the Iraqi war. They didn't allow 
you know, their ba the bases, the American base to be used. And that was very correct uh, decision. But at that time, the ruling party was still coming to power. He wasn't sure of his ability and strength. But now I'm, I'm sure that these policies are different. They are venturing more. They are trying to take a leading role in s s what we call probably bloody policies, which are not in the interest of the people of Turkey. When one looks at the international pressure being put on countries like Iran, for example, is it actually having the opposite effect? Absolutely. They are strengthening the position of the leadership in Iran vis-à-vis -vis their people. You mentioned the Cold War heating up. Do you think that this region is headed for war? And if so, who are the players? What you put as a question is a major important question. When, the, when you have Cold War, probably you are not play, play, uh, <coughs> planning a war, but it comes to a point where you cannot control. You, you cannot control. You bring explosives and you set fire near it. And it is only a matter of luck or time. And I know that there are many parties who could provoke pushing a cold war to a hot war because of their interest. Companies manufacturing arms are to be considered as the main uh, groups which have appetite for such things. And they were behind uh, a lot of wars which happened in Vietnam, in Korea, etc. So the advice is to avoid Cold War, to replace Cold War with dialogue, to solve pending problems, whether these problems are international or regional. When I say regional, this includes the Middle East. A lot of things happening in the Middle East. I think if there was wisdom and dialogue, they would be solved within weeks, and many innocent people will be saved. Adnan Amran, thank you very much for joining us here on RT. I thank you.